just down the street from mine, so we're <laughs> <laughs> so go Chargers. <laughs> um, Michael, you were kind enough to give me the details of what cases are taken by the state Supreme Court. Uh, maybe all four of you, uh, what is the percentage of your cases that after you went through the appellate court level and you wanted it to go to the state Supreme Court, what percentage of your cases went to the Supreme Court? I've had remarkable success in getting the attention of the Supreme Court. I've had 11 cases since 2004. Um, the reason for that, I think, is that I'm in a subject area that is of interest to the court and where there's a lot of ferment in the law, which is the revenue side of local government finance. So I argued two cases in 2017. I've got a case coming on for argument shortly, and I have two petitions pending at the moment. So you got 100% rate? No, but something like 50-50, which isn't okay. bad when the general average is 2%. Yeah, okay. Greg, you have? Rest of the panel? I've, I've not had the opportunity to litigate a case all the way to the Supreme Court. Okay, I want to just spend a little bit of time on the Supreme Court because it seems to me that what you've been commenting on is the, the scholarship of this opinion. And so I've had my experiences in county government with pretty serious lawsuits. Uh, on the retirement board for Orange County, we had the Ventura case, which just was an amazing sight to behold. And very expensive for all counties, 37 ag counties. Uh, we had uh, uh, the uh, recapture case where we had someone in Seal Beach who was trying to redo Prop 13 and Prop 8, very interesting experience. It was not accepted by the Supreme Court. Uh, I had my retroactivity case, um, which was a major constitutional concern. It, actually, I, I felt that granting retroactive Pension benefits broke two code uh, article sections in the state constitution. So I was hoping for a real scholarship <laughs> and said, great, now we're going to get these seven people, this, this brain trust to, to comment. But they didn't take the case. And so now I sort of live with the bitterness of realizing that maybe all three branches of government have blood on their hands for the hundreds of billions of dollars of debt that we, we have to deal with. But anyway, I'm just really curious. Would you comment on the scholarship? You kind of said it did, they didn't go through Section C and D, and they didn't address. So, I, I, are, do we have? Do we have? You use the term a laying a foundation, yeah. um, and I'm wondering over their heads. So, I want a confidence level. Or do we have a, a Supreme Court that's doing a, a good job by the citizens of California? Well, let me at least. Um, I don't know if I can have a larger commentary on the on the Supreme Court generally. I will say from a taxpayer's perspective, you know, over my career and certainly uh, the passage of Prop 13, uh, and I wrote this in my opinion that it, it, there's been a struggle with trying, feeling like um, as a as a drafter and as a taxpayer that we're not quite getting the language um, in initiatives uh, tight enough for <clears throat> skilled lawyers to uh, get around. Um, and, and that goes back, it, it could go back to um, Justice Moss's opinion in Richmond back in 82 where, you know, his, after Amador, Amador decided that, um, Prop 13 and, and applied a very broad standard, frankly, to it, that they were to, to grant a, a sort of a general construction, a very broad construction to the um, intent of the voters in applying the language of Prop 13. And then Richmond came along and, and, and Justice Moss said that his view of the two-thirds vote requirement was undemocratic. And I think that that taints any look at um, the effort to place a limit on the taxing authority. And I think that, that that view has permeated subsequent Supreme Court decisions because you've seen this back and forth between whether it was Prop 62 or Prop 218 or Prop 26. They were, they were answers to something. They weren't drafted. Even Prop 13 itself wasn't in a vacuum. It was in response to um, activities in the 60s and 70s with respect to the property tax. And so... Um, I guess, and I'm looking at this opinion, um, I, I can't say it's an indictment of the Supreme Court itself. Um, it, it, it is this opinion. I don't think it's, I, I think that they drew, they, they um, drafted a foundation for a subsequent um, question uh, that they're anticipating coming. Um, and um, I, I don't know that's a, a broader statement on the court itself. It's just that this opinion, I, I just think, raises many more questions than it needed to answer. And that, to me, raises questions. This is what's next. A couple of reactions to the question, if I may. One is that the court does eventually, sometimes it takes more than one petition on an issue for the court to take it. 
um, and the questions you were concerned about that they didn't take up when you were still in county office are now before the court in the Alameda and Marin cases. So they got there, it took them longer than you would have liked, um, and there were costs that were incurred along the way that you would have liked to have avoided, but they did get there. And what I would say about the court um, is that we've had a moderately conservative court since the Duke Magian administration, since the recall. And we now have three young Democratic appointed justices who are all very bright Yale law grads who did not have substantial experience in the California judicial system. Their experience was academia or it was the federal system. And so they are asking questions that have, would not have been asked by others. And the court is very much in a time of change. Um, the fourth appointment from the governor, and perhaps he'll have a fifth, uh, depending on how the um, conservatives on the court view the result of the June primary and the gubernatorial election, um, is going to make a huge difference for this court. And I think it's going to be in change uh, until it reaches some stability. And that stability may be a few years away. So this is a very fertile time. Um, and the change will be unwelcome to those who appreciated a moderately conservative court for two generations. Let's go to Mr. Shansky and see if Ms. Holt has uh, items. She'd like to be able to chime in. Mr. Shansky, and then um, a couple of things. One thing, interestingly, the Brown appointees split on this decision, right? This decision was written by Justice Cuellar, um, but Justices Kruger and Liu um, dissented. So this is an act. So in so far as, the, you know, I don't want to, um, you know, be overly uh, crass in terms of the court. I think that courts generally reach unanimous decisions not based on political um, party, though sometimes that's not true. But in this case, it's really not true. Um, and so I would just say that. And then secondly, um, the court reached a narrow decision. Um, it, it didn't reach out to this other decision about taxes, specifically reserved it. Again, it, has, it is suggestive, but it but it could have reached out to that question. It is a Supreme Court, it, it, it did not. And additionally, um, it is fairly grounded in broad constitutional principles that had been applied just the year before Prop 218 um, in favor of, of um, people who are, are peop, uh, concerned with um, limiting taxes. So proponents of uh, an initiative to um, prospectively repeal a tax, the question was, can you do that? Can you use the initiative power to repeal a tax? And the Supreme Court said, well, um, we interpret the initiative power broadly, and so you can. And so it is a broad, neutral principle that um, is, is grounded in California law that the justices applied, and they didn't apply it in lockstep by terms of any sort of ideological litmus test. So I think as far as this case is concerned, one can have legitimate disagreements, but I certainly don't think that it is, um, you know, uh, uh, a, 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 an unreasonable decision by any means. Thank you, Ms. Salt. I would echo what, what Ms., uh, Professor Shansky said, but also add that in large part, we're, we're stuck with a ballot initiative, which quite frankly was poorly drafted from the get-go. And, you know, I've been working on, on Prop 218 issues since its enactment in 1996. And even now, we're still continuing to see interpretations this many years later to basically understand what the voter's intent was. So ultimately, you know, I don't see an end to this litigation. And we have not only Article 13C here, but 13D, which continues to be an ongoing debate about what it means in the relationship to prop properly if he's in charge of the assessments. So, you know, I, do I blame the court for not going there? No. Um, ultimately, I, I think they decided to focus on the specific question at hand and that's what they did. Whether or not it has implications that extend beyond that, I don't think that they saw that as their role in that particular decision. Thank you for your uh, candidness, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Good panel. Thank you so much, Mr. Senator. We'd like to see if we have 